Hi, welcome to season two of the Let's K-12 Better podcast. This podcast is a project between Mama Capes and her kids. Hi! In our podcast, we will cover a variety of subjects involving K-12 education and family life. We will talk about the ways that parents, kids, and educators can improve K-12 education and family life. We encourage you to join our conversation on social media using the hashtag Let's K-12 Better. Let's jump into Season 2, Episode 3 of the Let's K-12 Better podcast. The new year brings new promises, new ideas, new hope. It inspires us to reimagine, realign, and reprioritize, providing us with the momentum and motivation to make necessary changes so that we meet our goals. A fresh start. We are celebrating the start of season two of the Let's K-12 Better podcast all month long with the What's Your Why, a series on exploring motivation and the imperfect journey to our authentic self. This month, you'll hear from people who found the inspiration to pursue the work that gives them meaning and purpose. We hope that you join us at the end of January for a live community discussion that will close out the What's Your Why series. How do we humans learn best? What is translational research and our school structured to provide educators the space to implement best practices for learning based on groundbreaking research happening in higher educations? Dr. Lindsay Portnoy is a professor in the Doctor of Education program at Northeastern University. In this episode, she shows us that learning does not have to be siloed by content, area, or age and that some of the best and proven practices for learning and content retention are not deployed by our current system of educating students. Her solution, better design and more play. We are delighted to have Dr. Lindsay Portnoy join us on the Let's K-12 Better podcast today. Lindsay is a professor in the Doctor of Education program at Northeastern University. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh my goodness, can I just tell you that I am so psyched to be here. I am a huge fan of the K-12 Better mission and everything that you and your kids are doing. I'm so thrilled to be invited. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your time with me. The feeling is mutual. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Well, like, let's just jump right on in because there's so much awesome about you that we are just excited to share with our listeners. So let's start off with um, having our listeners get to know you, right? You're a cognitive scientist, which is a super cool sounding title. Can you tell us what that is and also what inspired you to pursue that path? Um, Well, that's a really great question, and I happen to also quite like that title a bunch. Um, I always say that I am an expert in the science of learning, and I think my path to now is a very winding one that is ripe with a host of setbacks and also success. Um, I started about 20 years ago. I was actually a public school teacher, and later on I earned my PhD and became a professor, which is where I am now. Uh, Along the way, I co-founded an ed tech company. We raised millions of dollars in grant funding for research innovation. Um, And I've published my work in a bunch of different places, including Washington Post, USA Today, um, and other spaces I I know um, we could talk about them later. But frankly, you asked how I got here. And I would say I struggled as a learner, and I was regularly discounted by teachers, by professors, and even by peers. And I never knew the secrets to learning until so much later in my life. And so now that I do, and now that I'm a mom to my own two kiddos, I can be the advocate and ally that my kids need that I wish I would have had as a child. But more importantly, I can use the expertise, which is the science of learning, to start transforming the way that we do school. Um, This is sort of the foundation for all of the work that I do that is translational research, right? Like my mission is really, and I say this all the time, to take research out of the ivory tower, place it into the hands of every single citizen. So together we can work together and stop kicking this proverbial can of status quo ed 
down the road. I love that. Um, I love the science of learning. So it sounds like that just might be your title for <laughs> the podcast episode. <laughs> um, but also just love how you are channeling um, your like history and your experience into a career path that is a rewarding and empowering for not only yourself, but for other people as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to love what you do. And I also think it's important to have a bunch of different hobbies too, to be passionate about lots of different things um, so that you're never, you know, really stuck in a corner with one, with one thing that you're going to do your whole life. Although I have to say the science of learning is so vast and and exciting that I don't think I'll ever get bored of it. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, And we also need your work. So let's talk a little bit about how you've taken um, learning from the ivory tower to make it a lot more accessible for others. And I think that that's through your books. So um, you're the author of Design to Learn, using design thinking to bring purpose and passion to the classroom. Can you share a few of the main themes in this book? And also, you know, what you hope readers get out of it. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, This whole book is a book that I wish I had when I started teaching. It is all of that translational research from Ivory Tower to practical application. So the main things that I hope any reader will take away, um, well, I'd say first that learning doesn't have to be siloed by content area, by age, right? There are lots of different ways that we silo knowledge. Um, And that the way that learning really starts, powerful learning, is by taking the perspective of an other, right? Some people would call that empathy. And that also, you know, besides not siloing knowledge, whether by content or age, and by taking perspective and, and hopefully developing empathy, that the way that we measure learning through assessment can be so much more powerful effective, and frankly, asset-based. And I can give you some examples if you want of of each of those themes. Um, So one of the ways that we silo knowledge is by content and age. And what we know is that kids in early childhood can create powerful things if they're really inspired. A vignette I share in the book is about these two teaching artists called Off the Page, and they launched a study with a group of fourth and fifth graders in New York City public schools. And the study was on industrial growth and immigration in the 1900s. And this study transformed into a campaign that raised awareness about exploitive practices and it invited um, of labor. And it invited the entire community to learn more about the origin of the products that they purchased before taking out their wallets to make a purchase in stores. And here was a group of fourth and fifth grade kiddos who were learning history, right? But then they also were learning math right? They also were communicating, they were organizing, they were writing because they had to create flyers. Um, So it's every real content area that you think about in the classroom, but it was woven together in this beautiful interdisciplinary action-based campaign that, that really sparked imagination, creativity, and showed kids that they didn't need to wait for an invitation to be participants in, in learning and in changing the world. And that's just also the way that we hope that kids learn in general, right? Yeah. Like connecting all those dots, like, you know, going across all those content areas. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are many times in school where that's not, um, it's not not allowed, but it just doesn't happen. So that's that's just super amazing. I mean, I would say it's not allowed. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's not allowed. And, and it's not not allowed because educators don't want to do it. I do not believe that it's not allowed because teachers don't know that it's the right way to to teach. I just think that the way that our system is currently set up is that if you are going to give a kid a test on a particular topic that lives in a particular domain, you have to teach to that test. And our teachers know, they know that the best way to get kids engaged and inspired is to do these interdisciplinary and, and thought-provoking and meaningful activities And frankly, what research shows is that that's the best way to secure knowledge over time and prepare our kids for the future, right? Mm -hmm. How do you seek out information across disciplines and use information from math to help you in science and from science to help you in literacy and from literacy? Do you know what I mean? It's all connected. And we know this, but we're not doing it. Well, hopefully one day we can evolve into that process. <laughs> I have a book for you to read. There's a book yes. for that. Yes. What is book. That? There's a book. It's called Designed to Learn. No, yes. I'm, I'm not pretending that it's it's this magical panacea for everyone. 
but it's a really solid tool to start. And I think hopefully by by defining these terms and thinking about it in a little bit of a different way, it will inspire people to start taking the risks that are frankly not so risky, but you know might seem so on the surface. Um, and teeny tiny changes over time are going to change the world. I love this. Um, so since you're such a baddie, right? You have more than one book, <laughs> Goodness right? <laughs> yes, Stop it. claim it, Stop. claim it, and own it. Um, so you also are the author of Game On, Brain On, the surprising relationship between play and gray matter. Um, can you talk a little bit about like this book, right? And like how can readers use the concepts in this book in real life? So the book Game On, Brain On is all about, surprise, surprise, the cognitive science behind the power of play. And I share you know, decades of research in the science of learning and make the argument and maybe share to folks, hopefully share with folks, the power of play for learning and how so much of what we do when we play is foundational to successful and strong learning. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I just think that that last bit was just nail, head, boom. You killed it. All right. So we will move to the next question. I see some themes here um, in your writing. Um, So let's talk about like, how do these concepts in both of these books connect to create better teaching practices? Amber, thank you so much for saying this. There are connections, right? The theme is what I would call translational research, right? It's the science of learning, which by the way is not new, um, but it's, it's, it's not applied as well as it could be. And so my hope in translating the research in both of these books is to show how we can improve learning in small ways every day that over time will hopefully um, you know, become a snowball effect to, to, to creating the schools that all of our kids really deserve. Um, and we can talk about all of the different, you know, theories that are embedded. You know, we could start with, uh, you want me to start shopping in ideas because we can start shopping in, in the cognitive science if you're ready to go for it. Um, yeah, let's dive into just a couple, <laughs> right? And like, you know, and drill it down. You do an excellent, um, you know, bringing these concepts to reality for people who aren't in you know, the PhD and the ed D worlds. Yeah. Um, so please feel free to just, you know, maybe share one or two um, for the listeners. All right. So let's start with this idea of there's an entity versus incremental theory. So that's like high level, right? And it's this idea of like, is learning a set entity that we're born with, like an innate ability to know stuff, or can we grow in our knowledge over time? And very few people know that praise or the specific feedback that we give to our kiddos is how they come to see themselves as learners and how they internalize their beliefs as learners, and then how they use that frame to approach learning in the future. And anyone who's heard the idea of mindset, well, this will be familiar to you, right? But I think that in translating some of this work, we've watered down the ideas that are the most powerful, and we've lost sort of the bril- you know, the beautiful essence of what I think Dweck was going for in her initial research on praise. You know, it goes so much deeper than just be resilient, right? When our kids are playing, they do. They, you know, game over, but then they start over again. And so this idea of going back after something and not stopping because you believe that, you know, you only get one try. There's a summative assessment at the end of a unit of math, and now you're done and you do something different. This is not how games work. In games, you can go back again tomorrow. You don't have to clean up the block center because, you know, free time is over you can go back to Minecraft tomorrow and keep building. And that's what's beautiful about play. And it helps kids see learning as flexible and fun, and you can go back to it. There are other topics. Um, you know, I talk about, I don't know what would be most exciting. I talk about a topic of, of interleaving, which is where you learn a little bit about one topic and then a little bit about another topic, but you or, you learn them in sequence. So if you think about learning in a math class, you learn about slope, but you interleave slope with other concepts like ratios or exponents. And this is similar to the idea of interdisciplinary or, or learning different concepts, different topics, in the sense that you're really recalling different ideas, topics, or skills in a sequential way. And that when you do this, you're building stronger relationships in your mind to all of this content that you can recall later in more powerful ways. Um, 
I mean, even with assessment, right? Like mm-hmm. there are these terms that people bandy about metacognition and and it's a really powerful term. And it's how do you know when you know? Are you being mindful about your thinking? Um, how do you know when you can move on? I think about people like Sam Weinberg, who's a, a great also a cognitive scientist who does work on, on thinking like a historian. And he talks about how do you think vertically and how do experts check their sources and how do they know when they when they know something? This is really the heart of metacognition. Um, you know, epistemological beliefs I talk about, and yes, that sounds like a PhD word. It very much is, but it's a fancy word for what do you believe about knowledge? Like, what are your beliefs about knowledge and knowing, and how do those beliefs change over time? And frankly, this is such a powerful lens to use when we think about how do we help kids take perspectives, not just for those who don't know exactly what they know, but then they see themselves as perpetual learners. They can grow, they can get better, they see how their beliefs and their understanding of content changes over time, and it becomes a tool for reflecting. Mm. All of these are amazing. And um, I think that there are probably parents or educators who are like, whoa, you know, Um, and so I'm just they do these things like teachers do these things anyway. Parents do these things anyway. Like these Mm -hmm. are fine. These fancy words are fancy words. But the nature of these words, the action of these words is baked into all of our experiences as teachers with our kiddos and as parents with our kiddos. Like this is baked into the way that we talk to our kids every day. I love that you made that point because it is so absolutely true and it also leads into our next question right um how do we leverage or how can we leverage design thinking and games to invite kids and players of all ages to be co-creators in their learning journey i love that you're asking how kids can be co-creators i love saying hey come sit next to me and let's do something together and guess where that often happens? At home. And at home. Well. But get, I mean, and doing what? Like, think about when you're sitting next to your kid doing something together and there's a level playing field. Oh, I sort of gave it away. No, no, that was perfect. But so where does it happen? And it doesn't just have to happen at home, but it happens when you're playing. And it happens when you're sort of defenses are down because it's low stakes and there's like this innate joy to play Mm -hmm. and 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 you know that you can try over again it doesn't happen when you stick a worksheet in front of a kid and set a timer and say you have 15 minutes to complete this see how many of these questions you can do so if you really want to invite kids to be co-creators in their learning and you want them to be inspired and passionate you have to sit alongside them and demonstrate a a legitimate and authentic interest in learning. Um, I think that a lot of the ways we inspire our kids, especially as teachers, is by showing our passions. And one of the ways we can do this, I talk a lot about my sixth grade teacher. I had a really great sixth grade teacher, Mr. Gay, who was a huge fan of NASA and the space, um, you know, we were very busy launching, well, not real spaceships, but we bought, we, you know, we created model rockets. And frankly, his passion launched my interest in science. And I was like, wow, you know what? I like science and I could do science and I could be in science, you know, and then I had, you know, hills and valleys with that all the way through life. But the reality is every time you show your passion, you're sharing it with someone else who then might pick it up and say, oh, I might be interested in that too. I love that. I absolutely love that. I will say um, that the ability to show your vulnerability with the young people in your life is also a key component of that. In games, we can be silly and make mistakes and there is no, oh, I'm the adult and you're the child, right? It's like, we're all goofing around. Uh, You know, I won this time, you won that time or vice versa. And it just allows the child to really, or teen, to really get to know you, right? And so, you know, I am all about that. I just love it. I just love it. I mean, I love that you play games with your kids. I think that it's such a beautiful way to connect. And it also, you know, you think about play therapy. I don't know if you're familiar with play therapy, but essentially through play, you have conversations about things that are really important and mean something, right? And so I try to play games with my kids all the time, whether they're card games, we do lots of card games and tabletop games. And 
in the process of playing, yes, I certainly lose a bunch and not because I'm trying to, but because my kids are better than I am. And that's cool. And I'm like, look, you're better than me at this. And that's amazing. And like, teach me your secrets. Like, what is this Jedi magic you have? And they love it. And it shows that, that, you know, it's, it's empowering to them, but it's also a great way to have a conversation about, hey, what's going on in school? What are you working on? Like, what do you want to, you know, who are you playing with? Like, I heard you were earlier playing on, you know, on the screen. Who was that you were hanging out with? What was going on? You know, and, and you really get to know, obviously, who your children are. Hopefully, you know who they are. But as teachers, it's a great way to just have your kids share with you what they care about and where they are when they're not in your classroom, both, you know, physically, but also psychologically, emotionally, what they care about. Yeah, it's all about opening those doors to each other's lives, to each other's thoughts. Relationships. It's all about the relationships, my friend. So we've talked about all of the super awesome, amazing ways that design thinking and, you know, games really um, are tools for us to connect learning more deeply, right? Um, So let's talk about a few of the misconceptions that people have about design thinking or game-based learning. And I'm thinking like, what misinformation is floating out there um, that people are kind of gobbling up that, you know, are attached with design thinking and game-based learning? This is such a great question. So I think that there are a bunch of misconceptions about both of them. Um, One of the first things that I want to dispel is this idea of gamification and this idea of game-based learning, because those are two qualitatively distinct things. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, gamification is very much uh, perpetuating um, the the behaviorist view. If you think about, you know, stimulus reward, remember Pavlov and the dog and the salivating dog, that is the gamification of classrooms where you have the um, yellow and red and green stickers at the front of the room or the popsicle sticks that you move as kids move throughout their day and you're trying to level up the classroom. And I know I say that in the book a bunch, um, but it's by giving kids or people, anyone, a reward to do a behavior. And that's behaviorism and that's gamification. And I'm not at all um, suggesting that we use gamification. In fact, the difference between gamification and game-based learning is that game-based learning is you're learning through the play. It's meaningful. It's a meaningful experience that is helping you understand something um, in the world or something important to you. It's playful. It's fun. It's joyful. It's low stakes, but there's no sanction connected. Gamification is very sanction-based. So it sounds like a snack versus having a nourishing meal. Am I correct? It's sort of like it's sort of like a snack that you have before dinner when your caregiver said don't have a snack and then they find out later that you did and then you get punished and then you don't get any cookies ever again mm. for a week. So it's like I mean sort of like like I, and that, and I think that's part of the misconception, right? Like gamification is not a mini version of game-based learning. It is a qualitatively, it is wholly a different thing. Gamification is there are sanctions, there are rewards. Game-based learning, the play is the reward. Mm. Mm. So see, even I had it wrong, right? Um, And I love the fact that you kind of clarified here for all of us, right? Like the difference between the two. I just think that people, and I don't know if it's, I don't think there's wrong or right. I just think that we use the two sometimes interchangeably and they're not, right? Like I think we say, oh, you know, how great. I'm going to give my kids tickets every time they do something great and then they can pick a prize. And that's lovely. It's a, you know, it's a lovely thing if you'd like to do that. And that's very much gamifying. That's like a raffle or lottery. It's gamifying, but it's different than saying, I'm going to take this game that I love, like apples to apples, and I'm going to have my kids recreate a fun way to, you know, conjugate verbs in Spanish, and then it'll be silly and fun and playful, and the kids will be part of the creation of it. It's not, there's no punishment, there's no reward, which is Mm -hmm. gamification. It's actually learning because of the game. That's beautiful. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That was perfect. Yeah, Um, I totally wasn't meaning it to be like, everybody does it wrong, but most people just, they think about it. I think they think about it wrong or they don't understand it. And it makes me so mad when people are like, oh, game on brain on, learn how to gamify your classroom. And I'm like, no, 
no, no, no, no, please don't do that. Like, please don't use this book to gamify your classroom. If that's what you're getting out of this book, then you're not reading it or I didn't write it well. Both things are possibilities. Um, but like, please don't gamify your classroom ever. But please do appreciate the place for play and what it brings to your classroom and to your students and your kids. Yes. And the power of conversation that you can have because of play and the power of learning and the okay with failing and the knowledge that we're all in this together. And by the way, we are all on the same team, even when we're playing against one another, because we are learning from and alongside one another always. You asked about some misconceptions that people are having about design thinking or game-based learning. I think that when it comes to design thinking, the way that I wrote Designed to Learn is a slightly different take on the process of design thinking. It is what I would call an educational um, slant to it. And so I've, I've baked into the book a variety of tools for assessing as you're going along. Um, a lot of folks think that A, it's linear, which it's not. Um, B, it's difficult, which it's not so much of. My favorite reviews are the ones when teachers call or email or say, hey, I can't believe how much of this I was already doing. And this book in my hands is helping me operationalize all of the things I was already doing and extend them in ways to help my students be more confident learners, but also more engaged in learning. Mm -hmm. Um, When it comes to to games, (laughs) there's so many misconceptions it's so engendered. I feel like it's very, um, you know, let's just call a spade a spade. There are a lot of female teachers and a lot of females don't see themselves in the way that games are currently being played by our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I think that that's problematic. Um, I also think that when you say games, people automatically go to Minecraft, which by the way, is a phenomenal game. I use it constantly with my kids and and my students who are themselves educators use it in the classroom. Um, And it's a great tool, but there are lots of different types of of play. Um, Mm -hmm. So misconceptions that it's hard, it's engendered, that it takes a long time to do, it really doesn't. Um, Frankly, my, my biggest suggestion is just ask your kids, ask your students, put it in their hands and let them lead. And I promise you, I promise you, Every single time they will surprise you. One of the more famous learning scientists is a scientist named Lev Vygotsky who lived many years ago and his work talked a lot about a guide on the side and a lot of folks in education talk about teaching as either a guide on the side instead of being a sage on the stage. And the beauty of games is that the teacher, yes, is a guide on the side, but so too is another student or a caregiver, or a cousin, or a neighbor, or a friend. We can all be guides on the side, and that is what empowers kids to learn through play, is because they see the possibility of themselves as experts in play. Centering students. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. I know that was like five minutes more than we thought. I just wanted to make sure we didn't say gamification and game-based learning were the same, because they're not, and so please... Tell people not to do it. I will Please, totally Amber, agree. tell all the people I, not to do it. In fact, like that clip right there is probably going to be the promo clip. No, <laughs> don't do it. Um, okay, like you have a ton of knowledge um, that you've accumulated. So where can people find your work and your research and your book? And wh- just tell people where they can find you. Well, thanks, Amber. So my website is just my name, lindsayportnoy.com, and you can find all of the links to the writing that I've done, the books that I've written. Um, My books are all available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and bookshop.org, shop local, support your local bookstore. You can find me on Twitter at lportnoy, P-O-R-T-N-O-Y. And for the Philip Roth readers among us, I have no complaints. Okay, so this is totally amazing. Um, We are down here toward the end, which is super bittersweet because I feel like I could talk to you for hours and hours upon end. Um, Thank you. So this interview is part of our What's Your Why? A series on exploring motivation and the imperfect journey to our authentic self. So we have to ask, what is your why? This is such a hard question, Amber. Um, 
And I would say, you're laughing because you know me. Um, I don't think anyone has a single why. I think our why changes every single day. And my why today is going to be a different why tomorrow. Um, And frankly, the way that I move through life is more, why not? Like, why not? Why not take that? Why not try that? Why not take that risk? Why not write that article? Why not put that idea out there and see what happens? Because it might flop or it might fly. It might help someone else. It hopefully doesn't hurt anyone. Um, But no matter what, it helps all of us learn. It definitely helps me learn. Um, So I don't know. I don't know what my why is. My why is why not? And my why changes depending on where I am and who I'm with and what needs to be done. I think of that book. I think think I've talked to you about this before, the three questions book. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's completely subjective. Like who, who's around me? what needs to be done and how can I, how can I best serve those that, that, you know, I can support and be in service of? Yes. So I was like nodding my head. This was spoken like a true queen of the science of learning. So thank you so much, Lindsay, (laughs) for coming on this podcast and sharing your just awesome wisdom with our listeners. Thank you for having me. It is always such fun to talk with you. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear more. I can't wait to hear this whole series of What's Your Why. Thank you. It's going to be lit. It's going to be amazing. Knowing you, it's going to be brilliant. And that's a wrap. Yes, go us. Yay. Lindsay's why is rooted in understanding how we learn best. As she said in her interview, so much of what we do when we play is foundational to success and strong learning. Hopefully, by making the terms and larger ideas passed around in higher education more accessible, we will inspire people to start taking the necessary risks that push human learning and innovation. How do we infuse more meaningful play, game-based learning, not gamification, into our education system and our homes? How can we better connect content and information across disciplines for our young learners? What's our responsibility to ensure that proven and researched best practices are implemented and updated throughout the K-12 education system? We encourage you to discuss these questions as a family, with staff members, or online with your friends. If you have any cool epiphanies that you'd like to share, please leave them in the comments or connect with us on social media. Each episode, we will share quotes that we find inspirational. Kamala Harris is an American politician and attorney serving as the 49th and current Vice President of the United States. Her quote, We all have so much more in common than what separates us. Malala Yousafzai is a Pakistani activist for female education and the youngest winner of the Nobel Prize. Her quote, If one man can destroy everything, why can't one girl change it? Maya Angelou was an American poet and civil rights activist. She published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, and several books of poetry. My quote is, We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but we rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. Amanda Gorman is the Youth Poet Laureate and made history as the youngest known inaugural poet. Her work focuses on the African diaspora, issues of oppression, feminism, race, and marginalization. Her quote, We are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. Thank you for listening to the Let's K-12 Better podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, Please rate, review, and subscribe. 
We want to hear from you. Connect with us on social media at Let's K-12 Better on all social media platforms or connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Mom of All Capes. The Let's K-12 Better podcast is available on every podcasting platform. So if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review our podcast. Your feedback helps us grow. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.